uh, God has been pretty gracious, and my kids were uh, hanging out at home with Dad today, and I was sitting at the kitchen table putting some finishing touches on probably the most difficult passage of Scripture that we're going to work on. Uh, this is the most confusing, the most perplexing, the most, oh my gosh, there is nothing getting untangled at the end of this. Why is all this still hanging out there? And so we're going to tackle it. It actually uh, is in three, well, we'll probably take longer than three sections, but uh, chapters 11 through 14 enter us into this conversation about how in the world do we act when we're in worship? What does that actually look like? So before we get into that, I just want to set the stage like this. If you, uh, I like to imagine things. So um, if you can, I mean, I'm not DreamWorks or Disney or Universal, so I'll do my best. But can you imagine, just go with me in your mind and think about this. The church is extremely brand new. Does any, has anybody ever been a part of a brand new church before? Anybody? Man, okay, so the wrapping paper isn't even off of the church yet. Brand spanking new. And in your community, you're hearing about all of these stories. It's, it's growing so fast that you're hearing about all of these stories of people who uh, are out on the edges who you, uh, of, of culture and society, and you would go, they, their lives are changing like those people. And you're hearing about people at work, you're hearing of people that are hanging out with your kids at school and on the sports teams, and all of a sudden you feel this spiritual like tidal wave uh, that you're seeing happening across our city. And then somebody gets the nerve to ask you to be a part of it, and you've heard enough about it, and so you're thinking, I'm going to go, and I'm going to, I, I, listen, I've, listen, if God can change my neighbor, if God can change my boss, if God can change my mom, then surely God can maybe do something with me. So you go into the lobby, and you're greeted with the best smells in the world, fresh baked cookies and coffee, well, I mean, that's, you can't get any better than that, and then you're hearing like a thunderous roar from what you don't know it's called this, but it's like a worship center like this, and you're hearing this thunderous roar of people that are singing, and you don't really necessarily know a lot about God, but your culture, people talk about it at times, and then you go into the room, and as soon as you walk in the back of the room, it's literally chaos. I mean, people are singing to the top of their lungs, and the music is loud, and obviously they're singing about God, and you got some lady over in the corner babbling something that you can't even understand, and then another person is over on one side, other side of the auditorium doing the same thing, and then some gal stands up in front of the whole church, and she starts praying out loud, and she begins to say that, man, God has said this to me, and I got to say this to all of you, and she is just utterly distracting to the nth degree, not necessarily what she's saying, but maybe uh, by the way she's dressed. You ever been a part of those conversations before? You're like, man, that is so distracting. Hopefully I'm not distracting for you tonight, but uh, have you ever had those conversations before or have you seen that happen? And you go, I'm not saying what you're saying is bad, but man, you look bad, you know? Uh, this, I can't, I can't it, it, it taints the message because of the way you're coming across to me. And that is the picture of what you walk into in the book of 1 Corinthians. In chapter 11, you're making this swing into what it looks like to participate in one of their worship services. And Paul starts saying, okay, let's start here. And so that's kind of where we're going to go tonight. I actually have a little bit of experience with kind of some things that Paul uh, kind of is throwing down for us. I had this gal in my churches back in Oklahoma several years ago. And she was from a, I mean, we were like, I mean, we were Southern Baptists, but I mean, we weren't afraid to holler and we weren't afraid to, you know, people amen back at me and preach back to me and we weren't afraid of that. But this gal was of a different, you know, kind of church and she wasn't just, you know, preaching back to me. I mean, she would stand up and wave her hand at me and that's right, you bring it. She's actually having a conversation with me while I was preaching and at first I loved it. I mean, it was kind of fuel in the fire for me and then... It happened the next week, and it was fine, and then the next week, and then the next week. And I'm, I'm talking like very much, very distracting to what overall was going on because nobody else in the room even understood why that was going on and what had happened. And eventually, there was another gal who kind of, as far as if you want to call it like tribes or a denomination of what she was a part of, she kind of said, hey, listen, here, that, that's a freedom that you feel and you experience, but here's the thing is, is that that's not necessarily where we are as a church. And so I have said, you know what, I, I, I like to worship God in that way, but 
I'm not going to do that here because I feel like God's called me here. And so if God's called you here, you kind of have to fall in line with the order of the way the church is ran. And unfortunately, the lady didn't receive that very well. But uh, there is, comes a point in your worship where it, 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 man, truly is one of those things where it's like, man, that's a God thing. I've been a part of worship services in my life where I go, that's a God thing. And was it out of character? absolutely out of character. I was at same church at our broadcast campus. It probably fits about the same size of room as this. And man, this guy in the middle of the sermon, like in the very back, it was a longer auditorium. At the very back, he was one of our leaders in our church. At our church, we had deacons. And so he literally in the middle of my senior pastor's sermon, he just interrupts him and starts walking down the aisle. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I mean, there, we, well, we did. We had church security and these guys were like, what are we going to do? We're going to take him out. We're going to take him out. We're going to take him out. Because I mean, it was in the uproar of people doing things at churches. And so they, did, but luckily they're like, oh, no, no, no. We know who that is. Back off, back off. We know who it is. And in that moment, he just says, you know, man, this is what God's laid on my heart. And in that moment, the entire room just agreed with him. And you look at that and you go, that was utterly a God thing and was not about him, even though it might have felt like that initially, but it was not. And so you know if it's a God thing, if it becomes about a person and it, then it becomes selfish and then it becomes indulgent. And then if it doesn't do that, then it's got to be a God thing. And so we're going to w- wrestle through a little bit of this tension today. And let me just tell you, I, I, I have tried hard, okay? I, I, can't, I can't clear up what the Bible itself doesn't clear up, okay, in this section of, the, of Scripture. But I, I'll do my best, okay? And so we're only going to get through a handful of verses tonight. Um, but we're going to pick up the discussion in uh, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Are you with me? was not very convincing. Thank you. No, we worked this out. Yeah, all right, we'll see. It's not, I'm not shaven. And you'll know why in a minute. It's actually made the Bible study tonight. So anyway, verse two, okay. If it gets crazy, Bobby, you can just run me. Oh, there we go. We're going to run a microphone up here. All right. Oh, you want to just do safety? It's a safety. All right. Okay. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. It's already on, though, just in case. Okay, great. All right. Now we'll go into verse 2. Okay, so verse 2. Paul starts off and he says, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I have or as I delivered them to you. Paul's starting out on a good note. It's he's like being a parent or a good teacher. <laughs> he's like, okay, so here's what you're doing well, but, and I'm going to come into this middle of the sandwich and we're going to talk about what we need to work on. And so obviously he's saying that there are some areas of your heart and area, not necessarily heart, areas of your doctrine theology that you grabbed a hold of. It's the, uh, what, what we would call the closed-handed elements of the gospel. Like you got that. That makes sense and you have owned that. Those are the traditions that you have received and you're working that out and you're doing a good job. But here's some areas where I see some struggle. And he goes right in here into verse 3 and he says, but I want you to understand that the head, everybody say head. All right, there's a lot of head, heady, heady, head conversation going on this time. When my kids were really little, like my first daughter and second daughter when it was just the four of us, for some reason, heady became like stupid head, you know, in our house. So the whole time I'm reading this, I'm thinking of my now nine-year-old daughter who was three at the time calling a newborn girl heady. I have no idea why. Sorry. You just got into my mind. That wasn't planned. That just came out. You should be more gracious with me, okay? Thank you. Huh? Oh, thank you. Uh, So, uh, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. What is Paul telling the Corinthians here? There's a lot. And let's get a runner because we want everybody to be able to participate in our discussion today. So if you've got something, I know I've been letting you blurt it out, but we want everybody to be able to hear it. So raise your hand so we can get a runner to you. What's Paul telling the Corinthians here? Did I have a hand raised? Did I see one? Oh, okay, cool. Good job running. Dogs and 
charge. Say that again. God's in charge. Okay. What else? Always a good answer. What else? When you look at this, I, another hand's raised. I don't know where, but, oh, there we go. Got another one over here, too. So somebody get ready. Run, run, run over here. All the way over here. Keep your hand raised. I think Paul is talking about headship, not somebody that rules or something. This just a line of authority, and you, you have to have somebody who is the final decision maker, which is God, and then he passes his authority down in this process that he's going to talk about. I think you're on to something. Yes, sir. Say that again. Submission. 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 These are all great answers. And, uh, and really, that's exactly where uh, it goes to. There is, I do want to, I, I don't have time to get all, into all the, uh, there's a lot of nuance here, but there are a lot of disagreements into what, because people take these verses that we're going to talk about tonight and they, I mean, just all out of whack and take it all out of context and make it say something that it doesn't say. Like it says what it says, right? And, we, and here's the filter that I want everybody to like think through. I don't know if you wear glasses or contacts, but if you do, then you'll relate. The glasses that I want you to view this through, the prism that we're looking through is Paul, who did he write this letter to? To who? The Corinthian church specifically. Now, are there applications for you and for me as we observe this? Absolutely there are, but there are some specific things that are going on in the life of this church that Paul's going to speak towards and to. And so for us to immediately just go, oh, well, we just have to, that, because he said it to them, then that means that that's obviously, well, it's what we have to do too. And you'll see where we're going in just a moment. Um, we got to extract the principle of what Paul's getting to, and that's the best part of the whole Bible study tonight is the actual overarching principle. So Paul is talking. Uh, there's a couple of theories that I want to talk about, and it all comes from the word that our brother pointed out. It's the word head or headship. And uh, I just want to highlight two theories for you, okay? Uh, and it's the way that this word is interpreted. The first theory is this, that head means source. It means source. And think about that for a second. Head means source, theory number one. Think about a river, and a river has a head, right? It has a source. It's where the river originates, correct? That's where it all starts, and then everything flows out of that head and flows into that river and moves forward. So here's the logical progression of this theory, and I'm not saying I am supportive of this theory, I'm just telling you this is one major theory, is number one is that Christ is the source of man. A scripture that is good for that, uh, that, uh, that can prove this, is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, you can jot it down. Uh, then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Who did that? God did that. So in support of this theory, it's God was the source, the head, and the beginning of man. Number two, the second little th sub point under there is that man is the source of woman. I'm not making, it's right here, it is in the text, I think you can see that. Uh, Genesis 2.22 says that, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So in this theory, man is the beginning, is the starting point of and the source of the woman. Number three, the father is the source of Christ. John chapter 16. Why don't you just turn there? I want you to see this. This is, uh, just please do that real quick. Uh, because here's where, for me, where it breaks down. For this theory falls apart at this level right here. John chapter 16 and verse 27. Are we there? Are we getting close? That's a great sound. John chapter 16 and verse 27. If you got it, say, I got it. That's good enough for me. John 16, 27 says, For the Father himself loves you. This is Jesus talking. Because you have loved me and have believed that I, what's the word? came from God. Underline that. Verse 28. I, what? Came from the Father and have what? 
come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Now, here's the problem with this theory. I can jive with you uh, on the other two points at some level, but it's this point where it all breaks down. Because the word came or come is not exactly what these theologians say that it means. This word come here is not, has nothing to do with origin, origin or original form. It's not meaning that God then out of God came Christ and so God then um, is the head of Jesus and so then out of that flows other things. That's not at all what it's saying. The word here, let me just get to it right here. Uh, here lies the problem with the theory for me, the word came. Jesus didn't come from God in the sense of God being Jesus' source. He came locationally from God, but not originally from God. Are you with me? And so for me, this is where that breaks down. I want you to settle that with the Lord, uh, and I think that's a good thing for you to think through. But for me, it breaks down that God didn't exist before Jesus. The Bible tells us that before the earth was even formed in Genesis chapter 1, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all present in, their, in the Trinitarian view of God. They were all there from eternity past and currently now and will be forever. So then here's the second theory. The second theory uh, speaks of what we've already pointed out, of authority, and I, I like this word too, leadership. So one talks about source, and then the other one talks about authority, and I would even go authority slash leadership. All throughout the Old Testament scriptures, when you see um, uh, that, uh, you see, I, I mean, there are so many examples. I, I remember reading something in 1 Samuel, I see it in, in the book of Kings, you read it. All throughout the Old Testament, there are even tons of verses in the New Testament, in Colossians and in Ephesians. Uh, Paul is the guy. He is keen on this type of talk of headship, authority, and leadership. He uses word that Christ is the head of the church. He uses it in Ephesians for the husband is the head of the wife and the head of the family. This is what he uses all the time. Now, here's the thing. We have to be really careful with this theory, though, because the parallels among Christ, husbands, and God are not exactly the same. They're not exactly the same. Yes, God is a leader, Jesus was a leader, and a husband is a leader. Who agrees with me on that, right? Uh, okay, so then, and God has authority, Jesus had authority, and a husband has authority. Who's with me on that, right? Question, are all of their authorities the same? Not at all. <laughs> Drastically different, wouldn't you agree? Even Jesus, uh, even before he was going to go to the cross, he even asked the God. He said, God, I, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. And what did he do? What did he say? Thy will be done, right? He said, God, whatever you want is what I want. What is that a picture of right now? You can blurt this one out because I'll repeat it. What's it a picture of? You said it. Submission. That's exactly what it is. It's submission to an authority, to a headship, to a, a leader over him. So Jesus was even in that, fully God, fully man, but yet submission under the authority of God the Father. You trekking with me? And so this is the second theory, but we do have to be careful. All our heads, all our leaders, but they're leaders in different ways. This is just a really good way to sum this piece up. The, new, uh, the, in, the NIV commentary says that husbands are never the heads of wives in precisely the same way that Christ is the head of men. Nor is Christ the head of men precisely in the same way that God is the head of Christ. The Father did not create the Son, nor is Christ simply the subordinate of the Father. Whole theologies are built on that statement right there. The differences among the various members of these analogies make precise comparisons impossible. And so what we are getting at and what Paul is saying is that here's the thing. Everyone's under someone. Everyone is submitting to someone's authority, to someone's leadership. And the one thing that all of these leaders do have in common are two specific things. The first thing is honor. They all honored. So Jesus honored the father, wives honor the husbands, and the husbands honor Christ in their leadership. We are to honor these structures and these roles that God has placed in our lives. And secondly, it's the word that we've already talked about. It's submission. God ordained submission. Think of this. He ordained submission before the foundation of the world to prevent 
chaos. He did it, it, there, the, it when submission is in place. First of all, I can see your faces, just so you know. And I know that when people say submission, they go, ah, man, it just feels like awful. Does it feel awful to anybody else? It feels, it's okay to be honest in church. It feels awful to me too. Because when I think of submission, I think of MMA fighting and you get one of them in one of those submission holds and that's painful and that's not fun. But really submission done in a godly way is utterly beautiful. We got a statement. You want to say something? Hold on just a second. Let's get a mic. Run, 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 run. Right over here. Raise your hand for me. You got to run, run, run. I was just thinking that the way that Paul places this, where he says, I realize the head of every man is Christ. He's, he's, he's letting us know um, what our, um, who, who, we're, who we're trying to compare ourselves to. Like, hmm. Christ is actually the head of man, so as Christ being the head of man, that means that man has to honor um, his wife, even though he's putting him in, char- her, you know, in charge of, him, of her. Um, but it's in the same way that Christ is in, in charge of man. Um, and then when he says that Christ is, uh, you know, that God is over Christ, it's, it's, like, it's like this comparison that you can't just be just any kind of a, of a, of a husband. You know, you can't just be any kind of a leader. You're, hmm. you're, you're, the person you look to is Jesus, just right. like Jesus looks to God. So you look to perfection or... You know what I mean? Like almost. No, I, I do think there submission. is a linear. Can everybody, anybody else see? There is a linear progression that is happening. He's kind of. Uh, some theologians were saying it's a chain reaction. You can see it, and that's what our friend here is saying: is that there's a an obvious chain reaction of a pinnacle of focus, and then it kind of goes down from there. Though I would say that that parallel could break down again. It's almost impossible to go to the nth degree with all of the comparisons because you wouldn't want. Your, a wife wouldn't want to have the pinnacle of her focus to be her husband like the husband's pinnacle of his focus would be Christ. So you'd have to be super, super careful with the way that analogy does break down. Therein lies one of the tangled knots that Paul just simply doesn't totally untangle for us. And uh, we don't know necessarily why he didn't do it all the way. And we'll, we'll clear up some of this stuff uh, as we move on. But great and valuable input, by the way. Thank you so much. And... Uh, So God has ordained submission to prevent chaos. He's done it in your family. When there is submission in your family, I mean, I'm not saying that chaos is impossible. I'm just saying it's probably a little bit more under control. When submission is in your workplace, when people kind of submit to the policies and the procedures, even though it's not always fun, but it is for the benefit of the organization and the health of a classroom, an office, a building, whatever, Flourish, flourishing begins to happen when you think about it in the context of a government or a nation. When there's submission that takes place within the context of that, chaos does not ensue as quickly as it does when submission goes out the window. And God, uh, so submission, here's a couple of thoughts. Submission isn't surrender. It doesn't mean inferior and, uh, and it does not mean that. And so I know that's why a lot of us feel like Submission is a bad word. Uh, submission is mutual, listen, mutual commitment and cooperation for a greater good. Mutual commitment and cooperation for a greater good. I can illustrate it this way. I, we're trying to sell a house that we own in Oklahoma right now. We owned a rental property for years. And um, I, uh, we, we contacted our folks who have, I mean, they were in like a two-year lease and it's ending uh, in March. And so... I felt like at January, you know, hey, let's notify them that we're going to sell this property, but we're not going to sell it out from under them, yada, yada, yada. The reality is, is I talked to them in October of last year, maybe even before that, and tried to give them the first right of refusal. All that to say it didn't work. So they already knew this was coming. January rolls around, and we gave them a little addendum to their lease that just basically was a courteous Uh, move on our part to say, hey, we're going to sell this property. Here's kind of the things we want you to know. We want you to sign this. Well, they refuse to sign it. And I think we refuse. In what world does a tenant tell a landlord, a homeowner, that what they can and cannot do 
with regard to their property. So I started getting a little antsy and, uh, you know, I'm going to pick up that phone and let them know. And that's not kind of how that, that didn't go down that way at all. Uh, I finally got some good wisdom from some, uh, actually somebody that attends our campus that owns their own real estate company at Scottsdale. And so uh, I sat down oh, well, over the phone with him and I said, man, what do I do? He said, this is what you do. You don't need to send them that addendum. What you're doing is you need to have a phone conversation with them because all that you're doing is you are trying to work together with a spirit of cooperation that benefits them, that benefits you, and works with the agent. And so whatever you got to do to get that thing done, get it done. So we waited, and uh, here's what we wound up doing, was we called them on the, or I sent them an email, then sent them a text message, and then I said, hey, let's get on the phone. We finally, one day, after I was preparing for the mine one Tuesday, and I was sitting on my back patio, and the phone rings, and here the, uh, the lady calls me, and I said, okay, here's, here's what we're doing. And, and I said, this is where we're at, and we're going to sell the house. We're not going to sell out from under you, but in reward for you, the spirit of cooperation together with all these three parties, we're going to discount your final month's rent by 25%. Well, then what do you think happened? Well, okay, cool. All right. Now, I mean, it's not super cool because they'd love to stay in the house another year or whatever it might be, but with the spirit of cooperation that came through that, there was a greater good that was accomplished. And the reality was, is I had to concede some things. I had, she had to, uh, their family had to concede some things and our agent had to concede some things. And there was a spirit of honor. There was a spirit of submission one to another. And for the greater good, we moved forward. And I think if we can understand that concept as it relates to what Paul's unfolding for us in 1 Corinthians 11, I think we'll begin to see, oh, so th that's, yes, there are lots of things he's about to unpack about weird stuff that we don't necessarily have in the Western culture. But if we can understand that element right there, we can see where he's going so that we can apply this to our lives. So um, verse 4, he jumps in here and he says, every man who... Um, yeah, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Now, remember, we had all these conversations about heads, right? Who's the man's head? Yes, is it his physical head too? I would say yes, it's probably both. But, uh, but really, the spiritual overtone is where we're going today. Uh, but his head is covered, dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if uh, her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut her hair off or shave her head, let her cover her head. Okay. Somebody's going to the barber. So let's, let's, let's dig beneath all of this. In their culture, in the Roman culture, men, listen, men would cover their heads. You've got to track with me, okay? Men would cover their heads. They were wearing togas, not shirts, but like a big gown. And when they would go into pagan worship temples, they would go in and men would often cover their heads and enter themselves into the temple, into the worship center, the sanctuary, whatever you want to call it. And they would worship their pagan gods. And herein lies what Paul referred to in the previous chapters. You're mixing something that doesn't belong with Christianity and with Christianity. And he's doing it again, just in a different way. For the Corinthians to, uh, to, to enter into worship, just as a pagan did, would dishonor their head, Christ. It would bring not glory, not fame, not worship, but it would dishonor, disregard, and it would look like, okay, you're not, Christ isn't, uh, Christ isn't the chairman of the board of your life. He's not the, the pinnacle of your heart. It's something else, and you're sending mixed signals. Stop doing that. Stop doing that to the people in Corinth who are excited. They're hearing in your neighborhood. They're hearing at work of what God, now you're making me air quote, because of what God is doing in your life. But is it God or is it those pagan gods? I'm so confused. Would you stop doing that? Herein lies where Paul is going. 
So then he enters into this whole conversation about these women who pray and prophesy in church and who are coming in with their heads uncovered. Anybody confused by that? Raise your hand. Yeah, hands all over. Amen. Yes, double hands in the back. I appreciate that. And you're thinking, why does that even matter? Well, let me ask this question, and I think it'll get us onto a good discussion. Why is it such a big deal for women to walk into worship and participate? So they're walking into worship, and they're participating. Why do you think it's a big deal that their head's uncovered? Their hair is their glory. That is true. Anybody want to dig below that? Or does everybody just love that? Oh, right here. Maybe because women... Hold on just a second. We'll get you. Right right over here, microphone, please. Up front. Go for it. We'll go here first, Bobby. Right here. Maybe because before women weren't allowed in the church, and now they are. Could be part of it. Yes, sir. In the culture at that time, there was budding feminism where women were shaving their heads to make themselves equal, if you will, with men. And yep. Paul was talking directly to that. Yeah. There was um, essentially like uh, it was feminism of their day. It was the, pardon me, but the bra burning of their day. That's what that was. It was that moment. We're shaving our heads, baby. And it was this moment of being like a man. I'm going to shave my head short, and I'm going to have short hair, and I'm going to be like a man because I deserve the same rights they do, And which is really, Paul's saying, that's not even what we're talking about, man. And we'll see a little bit, but we're going to unpack that even further. Yes? Hey, Aaron, so I'm reading on that. I mean, the thing that comes to mind, at least to me, is is that he's he's talking about a young church. Yeah. And they're doing it wrong. Good point. Right? So um, I guess a parallel example would be a young Christian. Yeah. They're doing it wrong. Yeah. So... You Sometimes know, you don't know what you don't know, right? You don't know what you don't know. So right. you bring some things with you, and then maybe, you know, sounds like you straighten them out a little bit. Here, That's right? a great point. He is talking about a very young church. And counter to what you, uh, what, what you might think, uh, it's, we're not talking 7,000 people over six different services. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, again, it's, it's a lot smaller in context. What might be more like it is more like your small church or a life group or, you know, or multiple life groups that meet across the city of Corinth that then call themselves a church, uh, probably more resemble that. I'm not saying that there weren't hundreds. I'm just saying there probably weren't at this point. It was a very young church. So, yes. Well, I, I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I think it refers a little bit back to three because the three relationships that are mentioned there. Yeah. Uh, it's the relationship between man and Christ, man being born again and he's one with Christ. Yes. Uh, the second relationship is man and woman. Through a marriage relationship, they're made one. Mm-hmm. Okay, the word for God in the third phrase in that verse is theos. Mm-hmm. It's not father, it's theos. So theos is ahead of Christ. God is ahead of Christ. And then when you get to the next verse, it's talking about your treatment of your head. Of say that last, head. say that s- sentence just that it's last. The treatment one. of your head of the person who is ahead of you. Right. It's the person who's ahead of you. So, so it's a, you're mated, you're intimate with Christ. Mm. Hmm. We got one right over here. Run, run, run. Right by the camera, to my right, your left. Don't you think he still wants to keep the order of um, submission, so you have God, Christ, man, woman. Mm-hmm. And if she doesn't cover her head, she's equal to man, and it's slightly putting it out of order. And that was the whole reason to keep an order uh, for things to flow. Correct. He's definitely talking about the creative order that God established in Genesis. He's definitely talking about that. So let me, let me help uh, all these. Uh, yes. And amen. And in this Mediterranean culture that they lived in, for a woman to walk into worship with her head uncovered would be a huge deal, a massive deal. Uh, Women in their culture often wore veils uh, that covered their heads, and it was a symbol of honor, submission, humility, uh, and modesty often. It was a modest thing. And it was something that was extremely cultural within the context of Corinth, specific to this church. 
And these women in their day who wore those veils in public worship chose to do that as a sign of their submission to their husband and then ultimately to their heavenly father. That's why they did that. Nobody's off in the back room saying, you got to, you got to, you got I'm sure there were men who did abuse that, but really, as in men today who abuse their headship and leadership at home when nobody else knows about it. And so that does happen, but these women chose to do this, and it was a sign of being submissive to their husband. Now, the only women in their day who worshipped in church, without head coverings, were women who worshipped pagan gods and women who were prostitutes. And then there was the budding feminism of their day as well. And so you had this whole, I mean literally, bending this direction of pagan worship, identifying as a prostitute, not being who God created you to be, young lady. Uh, that, that is who God made you to be, so be who you should be. And don't be who God, don't, don't try to be somebody that you're not. And so these women, Paul is reaching out to them and saying, listen, what you have is a very beautiful thing. And we couldn't have what you see with your very eyes today if you weren't alive. Hello? And so he's pushing back their culture. So if you're, uh, so think about this. So if your wife was going to go to church with this kind of attitude, this um, thumb in their nose at God, it's a, it, listen, for a woman to walk in church their day, in that moment, in that time, it's, I mean, this is a hard parallel for us to draw, but it would be like some gal who went to a club on Saturday night and knowing that this would be very distracting and very counter to what was going on here and walk into this front right here. I'm not saying, I, that's as close as I can get. And that's not even a good piece because we should welcome all kinds of people, okay? So I know, you, you with me? Like it's not, it's just hard what Paul is saying. He's going, listen, but what you're doing is you're bringing that pagan form of worship into the church. You're confusing people. And it's not about, you know, feminism. It's about worshiping the creator alone. And he is the sustainer. And he is your everything. And he'll walk with you through this life and give you meaning and purpose. A man doesn't do that. And a, you know, a raw woman, uh, you know, I'm all for equal rights. But God's saying, listen, you have no rights under me. Submit under me. So, Paul is saying that it's a big deal because he said it already. You're not your own. You are free, but not to be free like that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. For you were bought with a price and you're not your own. So glorify God in your body. And so what he's saying in this instance with these group of people, he's saying, listen, this type of behavior is indicative of a selfish attitude and nature in worship. You're drawing all the attention and all of, the, all of the focus upon you and what you look like, what you're saying, what you're doing. And listen, you're not worthy to carry the weight of that worship. Only God is. And so he's m pushing against this selfish attitude. And he would rather them honor the Lord with their life, submit yourself willingly uh, to the new way of living because doing what you're doing right now dishonors God's creative order. We have a question right here. Right up here. Don't be falling asleep on the job. Just pass her down. There you go. I think it was important for Paul to, to remind the Jewish people um, to stay true mm -hmm. because of the history of the mm. Jewish people yeah. for, for since, actually since the Exodus, to, thought, to do what they thought was they, they, want, they wanted to do right. instead of what God wanted to do. Right. And then in the, we were, start, were studying Judges on Wednesday morning, mm -hmm. and that's what they did. And that from the judges would rescue them, they would be thankful, and as long as that judge was alive, they would be obedient. Right. And then that judge died, 
and they would be disobedient and do whatever they wanted to, follow after idols, and it was just so easy for them to do that. And I yeah. think Paul was trying to prevent any, any um, falling away. Yeah, I think that is such a good point. I mean, you think about all in the, in the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, they were laden with, I mean, they had horrific leaders, but some unbelievable leaders. And as soon as, I mean, we talked about this a few weeks ago when Moses went up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments and it took all of a nanosecond for the people to go, where's our leader? Where's our leader? Let's make a golden calf and let's worship that. Really? That's better than God? You know? Um, and so the interesting thing is, is that by way of principle, we need that same reminding often. Be careful where your heart goes. Be careful of your selfish inclinations. Be careful of that moment where you see yourself leaning like towards idolatry, which is what we talked about for the last couple of weeks. I think that is a very, very good and very healthy and right reminder for us. So then Paul goes in and he starts kind of supporting his theory here in verse 7. And he says, For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image of and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Neither was man created, oh, sorry, verse 8, for man was not made from a woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So, here, here, here's what Paul's saying. Men shouldn't cover their heads because pagans do. <laughs> That's really what he's saying. Don't, like, don't confuse people because men are made in the image of God. Think about this. They're literally the men. We are the fabric because of we're descendants of Adam. Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth. And so there in that, uh, he's the creation from, directly from the dust of creation to reflect um, God's glory. So covering your head in some way covers the glory. Then he goes on. And he says about women, women shouldn't, or no, women should cover their heads because pagans don't. And Paul called women the glory of man. What in the world does that mean or what does it imply? That a woman is the glory of man. Right here we got one. She's a direct reflection of her husband. Direct reflection of her husband. It definitely follows that train of thought that we pointed out earlier about the kind of the chain of headship there. Right here. Okay, so I have a study Bible. I have to read this. God created lines of authority in order for his created world to function smoothly. Although there must be lines of authority, even in marriage, there should not be lines of superiority. God created men and women with unique and complementary characteristics. One sex is not better than the other. We must not let the issue of authority and submission become a wedge to destroy oneness in marriage. Instead, we should use our unique gifts to strengthen our marriage to glorify God. That's great. Where was that study Bible when I was preparing? It was at your house. <laughs> That's where it was. Wow. I, so good. So rich. In the creation narrative, Moses in Genesis 2, we've already read a piece of it. In Genesis 2 and 18 and 20, the scripture says, Then the Lord said, uh, the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Then in verse 20, the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds uh, of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So when God made Eve, listen, listen, this is so good. When God made Eve, when you think about superiority and submission, when God made Eve, he made it possible for the human race to fulfill the mission that he gave Adam. Subdue the earth, multiply, fill the earth with a populace of people. Adam couldn't do that by himself, yo, just so you know. Eve couldn't do it by herself either. And the creative order of the creator of the universe 
is set into motion in Genesis chapter 2. And it talks every way, shape, or form. It, uh, the way I like to say it is, it reeks of not superiority, but of co-submission one to another. He uses the phrase helper. Eve was a helper. It totally sounds inferior, but it isn't. It means, um, um, it, 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 it means an aid. She was an aid to Adam. Like, you can't accomplish the mission without that specific piece of the puzzle. And if the mission was to fulfill the, you know, fill the earth and multiply and, 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 and carry this out, like you couldn't do that with anybody or anything else other than Eve. She is the aid to the mission. You need her to pull it off. Moses later in verse 20 says that there wasn't a helper fit for him is the phrase. And some translations say suitable for. Uh, and I don't even think that's a good translation because what it means is the mirror image of. That Eve was the mirror image of Adam. Does that speak of superiority and inferiority or co-submission one to another? He just mirrored her. He mirrored or she mirrored him. She was the mirror image of Adam, who was the image and the glory of God, thereby making her the same, i.e., the glory of Adam. You tracking with me? With her willingly honoring and selflessly submitting herself to Adam, who was her head, and Adam... Um, and submitting herself to Adam, and then Adam submitting himself to God, the human race would become all that God intended it to be. That's the beauty of submission. And it, listen, listen, the beauty of submission accomplishes the work of God in the world. The beauty of submission in your marriage accomplishes the work of God in your home. The beauty of submission accomplishes the work of God that he's called for you for the task that he has at your job. Like just trotting out with arrogance and that attitude and autonomy is a very, very fearful thing to fall into. He's talking about submitting. So, verse 10. I feel like this is one of those knuckle curveballs right in the middle of the whole thing. We got some, okay, come on. Yeah. I got a question. Uh, okay, so it seems like instead of submission, it's a question of oneness, right? Okay. Be because because with Christ we're made one with Him, right? And then in the Godhead is one Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then when the woman and man, you know, marry, there's oneness there. Yeah. So so you can take the word submit. Can you take the word submission, and you can put oneness in there? You totally could. Because you're hurting, you're hurting your oneness. Right when you're not, when you're not working the way you're supposed to be working together. I think that oneness. I mean, obviously it doesn't say that, but I think the application is that for sure, definitely. Excellent point. Verse ten, knuckle curveball. All right. This is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. And he's not talking about the baseball team. I literally have a red question mark off to the side of my Bible in the margin because I'm thinking, okay, Paul, awesome. Because of the angels. Are you sure? Is there not a better footnote? You know, the study notes in your Bible aren't inspired. You know that, don't you? I mean, they're, they're great, but they're not the revealed word of God. There are countless theories on what in the world Paul was trying to say. Um... It's so difficult to hone in on what Paul was trying to communicate to them. Uh, and that means it's going to be super, super difficult for us to understand. But one scholar, I just need to read it, <laughs> attempts to answer this perplexing nature of this verse. He says, Paul is here speaking of holy angels whose supreme characteristic is total and immediate obedience to God. And he goes off onto this whole tangent, which is right, that angels are very powerful in their divine power. 
Um, and the angels originally, before the creative order happened, there was a group of angels and the devil that uh, felt like they could supersede God. There was a power there of some kind, and they took it, tried to say, oh, we're that powerful to do that, and obviously they all fell, ergo uh, Satan, hell, and his demons. And so they didn't willingly submit to the authority of God. They said, I got this. And so the reality is, is when you and I choose little side note here, to not submit ourselves to the authority of God in our lives, in our marriages, in our homes, in our work, and all that we do. Um, where does that end you? Where do, where, where do you end up there with that? You fill in the blank. It ain't good. It's dark. It's confusing. And it feels like it's never going to end. So he goes on to say, the holy angels are the supreme examples of proper uh, creaturely submission. These messengers are God's protectors of his church, over which they stand perpetual guard. It is proper for a woman to cover her head as a sign of submission because of the angels in order that these most submissive of all creatures will not be offended by non-submissiveness. I feel like that's a little bit of a stretch. I do agree that there is a supernatural thing going on when the worship of God's son is happening and we're adoring him and we're preaching and proclaiming his word there are angels I believe it there's supernatural forces that are going on that we can't see and if you don't know that go read book of Ephesians it's very very real very very real it happens and it's happening in your life every moment of every day every single time you're awake and every single time you're asleep it's happening so wake up to it and so I do believe that there are some supernatural elements going on in this very moment right now. Very cool to think about, by the way. I don't necess- I think they are concerned of the obedience and the honor and the glory and worshiping God. I do because the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 6 that they even have wings to cover their eyes because God's glory is so bright and so amazing and so they are definitely concerned of that there's no doubt i don't know if that's necessarily what that means another scholar interprets the word uh, angels as messengers as it is in the book of revelation where the bible says that i write these to the angels at the church of where just pick one if you know it sardis philadelphia What does that word messenger mean in that context? Does anybody know? Say it. Pastor, leader, can you just say, give me a thumbs up if that's what you said? All right, pastor or leader? Okay. That's what it does mean, yes. And here, it's the same word, messenger, angel. It's the same word. And so I would probably lean towards the direction of that being a messenger in a in a service, somebody bringing the heat, if you will. And uh, even Mark chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 11 refer to John the Baptist as an angel, as a messenger of uh, the Lord for God. So within the context of these verses, these ladies, listen, get it, they're in their worship service. It's a non-formal way of praying in in front of the crowd, essentially, and prophesying, saying, God says this, um, and they're being messengers for God, and they are pretty brazen with their appearance, a.k.a. I'm shaving my head to look like a man. I'm shaving my head, and I resemble the pagan worshipers. I resemble uh, the temple prostitutes. I am, uh, I am detract, distracting from the message. And I think they're being extremely, as baby Christians, extremely real in the sense of, man, I really feel like God's telling me this, or I'm praying for these people that are hurting, and I'm, I'm doing this. But their presentation is awfully distracting to what's going on which is why it's super important that he's saying, cover your head, because as a messenger, you're distracting everyone. That's the direction I'm going to lean. I'm not saying I'm settled on it. I'm just saying that that's the direction I'm leaning on what it means. I feel like that's the best way to interpret that. Even another scholar follows that line that we just mentioned with a slight difference that the angels are the specific church leaders at the church at Corinth, and Paul got a message 
from these messengers about what was going on, and he, that's why he's writing this, a.k.a. I heard about it. Cover your head, man or lady. At the end of the day, we're super unclear exactly what this little phrase is here for, uh, but what we do know is that how you carry yourself and how I carry our, myself and how we carry ourselves in worship matters. At the end of the day, that's what Paul is getting at. How I carry myself and how you carry yourself needs to fall in the background of what's going on in this room and not into the foreground of what's going on in this room because we don't want to be a person, for Thessalonians, that we would quench the Holy Spirit of God. We don't want to be the person preventing God from doing something in my wife or my husband or my kids or somebody sitting on my row, uh, you know, with me doing what I'm doing and saying what I'm saying and being being what I'm being or whatever it might be. I don't want to be the cause of an interruption of a spiritual conversation that God's trying to get to the heart of that person. We've got to be super, super careful with regard to how we are carrying ourselves in worship, not drawing attention to ourselves, but pointing to Jesus. He goes on in verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, which is super key, woman is not independent of man, nor uh, man of a woman, for as Woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. All things are from God. Basically what Paul is saying is, listen, the woman's authority complements his and his complements her. We've already talked about this. It's equal, it's submission among equals. And just in case there's some egomaniac man out there that is going, well, God made me first, lady. True. But as we say in the Swenson household... Who borned you? (laughs) This is not a joke, but it was your mama that borned you. You need her. That's what Paul's saying is, listen, you need her, she needs you, and God is using you to accomplish his mission in this world. And so before you get all high and mighty, Paul gives the biological lesson. Where did you come from? You came from your mom, so you need her. And while I'm here, and I don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to wrap up with this. While I'm here, um, this is important. While in the creation story, God created man from what? The dust of the earth. Now, because God made me and made other men in this room from the dust of the earth, it doesn't mean that you need to act like dust. It also doesn't mean that you need to treat your wife or other women like dirt. Do you hear me? It doesn't mean that. You know that when God took the side, or that when God made Adam and he made Eve, listen, listen, that God made Adam in the image of his son and then Eve was the glory or the image of Adam. Here's what happened is God did not make Eve uh, from the bone of Adam's hand so that he could physically dominate and control her. Adam did not get put to sleep so that God could create Eve from a bone from his head so that he could intellectually dominate all the conversation. God didn't take a bone from Adam's jaw so that he could verbally abuse her. God did not take a bone from Adam's foot so that he could stomp her her dreams out. God took a bone from Adam's side, from his rib that was close to his heart as a symbol that you have my heart. We are walking through this life together and we, I am, yes, I am going to be the leader of this family and of you, but here's how I'm doing it. It's not, hey, honey, catch up. I'm going this direction. It's, hey, honey, come walk through this with me step in step together as we go after Jesus. That is where really Paul is saying, for men in this church, that's the way it's going to look. Don't get all high and mighty. That's not the way God created it. The way God created it is we're coming like right here. That's where we're going, baby. And let's go the whole journey with you and me all the way, no matter what. And the reality is, is I don't know how people at the church of Corinth would have received this message about head covering and shaving your head bald and Dudes needing hair or no hair or whatever that is. And, you know, he's saying, listen, nature even proves it. He goes down here and he says, uh, judge for yourself. It is proper for a wife. Uh, Is it proper for a wife to pray with her head uncovered? How do you think they answered that question now that they just heard Paul? Probably should cover her head. 
And then he says, does nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. And really, when my daughter, first daughter was born, she was bald basically till three. And now she's nine. And her hair is literally just an inch below her belt line. And that's where it's stayed for three to nine, essentially. And we only trim it. Why? Well, first of all, if I had a dollar for every single time somebody said, oh, your son is so cute, I could have a college fund paid for by now. But that is her glory. That is what we, I mean, we love Sydney for many different reasons, but that's one of the things. You have such beautiful, long hair. You are a gorgeous little girl. Man, look what God has done with you. You were bald, honey. It was awful, but look at this. <laughs> it's her glory. It's part of what makes her, her. And Paul is saying, listen, when a dude looks around, it's pretty obvious. I don't look like them. They got pretty long hair. And I got a beard. And I don't know why you guys keep fighting that stuff off, shaving it every day. God does that on its own. Like, God made that happen. So, that's nature. Amen, right? Just don't shave it. I notice you shave your beard, by the way. Yeah, just keep it real. Just keeping it real. Whole thing do, does it by itself. So, anyway. Um, so then, Paul, listen. I don't know how people receive this, but this is what he said. Lastly, right here, last verse. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, if any, you think anybody's going to argue over this? Hello, it's a church. Of course they're going to argue over. They're going to argue over paint. They're going to argue over, should I cut my hair or not? They're going to. And you're thinking, do church people do that? Stick around for a while. It'll happen in your circle too, okay? We have no such practice. Paul's saying, no, nah, not us. That's not what we do. We're not going to argue over this. We're going to follow what the scripture teaches. And the churches of God don't have a practice in this either. It follows church history. This is just what we do. Now, it is absurd to say that we are going to have a hair growing clinic next Sunday after the 915 service or 905 service because everybody's growing their hair out. You can't wear hats in church. People have, you see what I'm saying? People have taken this and completely flipped it to where women can't cut their hair and dudes can't wear hats in church and all that. I, 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 I I, I'd be really hard pressed to find that right here. What I see right here is that God is saying through the Apostle Paul to the church of Corinth, your heart matters in this. And if you're doing everything you're doing, if it's selfish in motive and drawing attention to you and you're distracting from the gospel, stop it. Quit it. Because you're confusing people. <laughs> and I want you to be obedient to me. Follow that leadership, which makes a whole other sermon in dudes, how are we doing? with our families. I didn't even have time to go in there. I wanted to, but I couldn't. How are we leading our families and how are we following Christ? So the principle is very, very clear. You gotta check your heart. You've got to check your heart and allow the Spirit of God to convict you and then surrender it. Like convict you like we talked about and literally run the other direction. Here it is, boom. Here it is, boom. I'm running towards Jesus, period. End of discussion. That's why Paul said, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Boom, surrender, go. Surrender, go. He said, I'm just running. I'm chasing. I'm going after him. And as hard as I can, I'm gonna make it, I want it to be impossible for people to get distracted by following my life as I follow Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your goodness to us and um, your faithfulness and your grace because the reality is, is that sometimes there are just things in the Bible that are, man, it's hard for us to understand as Western believers because there's so many cultural nuances that we just gotta dig under and dig under and dig under and go, well, now what does that mean and what does that mean and what does that mean? And Father, we couldn't possibly dig into all of that in one night, in one passage. But really, Lord, what we believe, the whole overarching truth of this passage is that we submit ourselves unto God and we chase after you. And God, we desire that in this room, as we gather in studies like this and as we will gather in our life groups and small churches all throughout the city uh, with groups and studies and Bible studies with women's Bible study, men's Bible study, and all the things that we do within the services of this room, that whatever we do, may it not be distracting people from the word that you have for them, but may it be attracting. God, may our lives and what we do and how we live not burn bridges, but build bridges to get people to Christ. 
And God, may we use this study, as crazy as this is, and how nuanced it is, may we just say, whoa, I see what you're doing there, God, and I see that I need to be paying attention with my heart and how I'm walking through this worship service and what I'm doing in my life with regards to how I'm doing life with other Christians. Father, thank you for your word, and even when we don't fully understand, there's still just great power sitting under it and hearing it. We're grateful for that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. We'll be praying for you this week. We'll see you Sunday.